Hi, everybody. Um, my name is John Quackenbush, and uh, welcome to my bioconference live presentation. Um, I was asked to describe uh, some of the work that I and my colleagues have been doing in the, the realm of really building a program in personalized medicine. And um, when we look at personalized medicine, one of the things we've come to recognize is that there are two pieces to the puzzle that we're trying to solve. One is uh, a piece of the puzzle that really deals with the delivery of personalized medicine services and care. And then the practice of medicine, um, the requirements are very, very different from those in research. That what physicians are looking for, even with large-scale genomic data, is to have that data distilled down to some sh something which is easily interpretable and actionable. So while we might be able to sequence an entire genome, most of what they want to see is information that they can use in a short period of time to make a diagnostic or prognostic decision. Now, those aren't the kinds of um, applications of personalized medicine and genomic medicine that uh, we really see written up in the newspapers. What we tend to see are the applications where someone sequences um, a child with a rare disease going through a diagnostic odyssey, and a group of people sit together um, in a room and try to make sense of what's in the genome. Uh, and that's a really exciting application of genomics in medicine. But it's not the one with potentially the greatest impact, the one that's going to have um, an influence on how a large number of people are treated. Um, but both of those really fall sort of into the domain of, of delivering healthcare and delivering medical information that is informed by genomics. But how we get to the understanding we need to make either um, some kind of strong conclusion based on uh, diagnostic evidence or how we tie together different pieces of information to distill out something to report to physicians is still really driven by uh, research. And so what I've been thinking about a lot in the work that I've been doing um, over the last few years is really thinking how we build a program in personalized medicine focused on research. And that's what I'm going to talk to you about today. So I should at least start with some disclosures. Um, it's important to at least note that I'm on scientific advisory boards for a number of different companies. Um, and also that, uh, and this may not be surprising to some of you, I and a colleague uh, founded a personalized medicine company uh, really um, focused on delivering software solutions and tools to support personalized medicine in research, uh, in the practice of clinical medicine, and uh, supporting patients and patient communities. Um, however, I'm not going to present any of that work here, uh, nothing done in any of those companies. Uh, really what I'm going to do is tell you about my experience uh, based on uh, working at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute and really thinking about how we would um, develop uh, personalized medicine solutions here to drive research forward. So one of the things I like to do in uh, presenting work is to use quotes. Uh, my background is actually in physics, and so uh, maybe not surprisingly, I have a quote from a physicist, Jules Poincaré. Uh, Poincaré said, science is built with facts as a house is with stones, but a collection of facts is no more a science than a heap of stones is a house. And for me, I really like this quote because it crystallizes some of the challenges in doing uh, genomics and genomic medicine in the sense that what we're able to do now in a really profound way is generate absolutely tremendous quantities of data. Um, and the challenge is to take that heap of stones, that huge pile of data, and to put it into some kind of framework so that we can make sense of it. And so the way I like to think of our challenge is the challenge is taking data and turning it into knowledge and knowledge into understanding. When I think about this problem, I actually have another quote from myself, and that's about today. I don't know where I lost you, but what I'll tell you about today is a story of um, really describing how we've thought about the, the whole problem of implementing personalized medicine. So uh, one of the things I've done over the course of my career is work with genomic data in the context of understanding human disease. And one of the really fascinating things about it is over the last few years, we've been able to think very critically about how we apply genomics to really look at the entire life cycle of
now. Go. All right. So, uh, until we have those technical problems, uh, what I was hoping to tell you was that we've really thought about how we use genomics to address the entire life cycle of disease, from doing a better job of estimating uh, genetic risk to doing better early detection of disease, patient stratification, disease staging, selecting really with the goal of selecting the appropriate treatment option for each patient. And our goal in doing that is to really best um, improve the overall survival and the quality of life of our patients. I think one of the things that we've seen time and again is that our patients want exactly the same sort of thing that we all want. Well, we all know that one day we're going to die. We just want that to be as far off in the future and as pleasant as possible. So really our goal um, in, in trying to build a program in personalized genomic medicine is, is to think about how we assemble the tools we need to address each step in this life, life cycle of disease. And largely, uh, the, the tool that we've had available to do this has been um, array-based uh, technologies for generating genomic data that we can then use uh, to really uh, ask questions about each one of these individual stages. And what's exciting today is that uh, these arrays are increasingly being replaced by um, sequencing-based technologies that have the potential to generate uh, much more complex, much more interesting data types and data sets that we can use to begin to look at an integrated um, interpretation of disease. So um, in order to do this, what you really have to do is think about various steps in the process. And I'm going to outline them, outline them here and then talk about each one of these. Uh, the first thing you have to do is think about assuring that you have access to samples and some kind of rational consent because really it's patient samples that feed the entire process. You have to develop a technology platform. And um, a few years ago when I was giving versions of this talk, people would ask me what sequencer they should buy. Uh, that, the answer to that question is almost uh, irrelevant today. Uh, all of these technologies generate one and only one thing, and that's data. Um, and whether you choose to do this internally or to outsource ge data generation, Really, that choice of technology platform is one that has to deliver you data so that you can start thinking about really putting the other key elements in place. Um, in order to, to do that and put those elements in place, what you have to think about is information integration. Um, genomic data is really wonderful, but the only way to interpret it and make sense of it is in context. So, you know, I'm um, uh, a pretty healthy, normal individual. If you were to sequence my genome, you could learn about my gender, which you probably already know, uh, my ethnicity, uh, which uh, I could probably make a reasonable guess uh, about. I could tell you if I have sticky earwax, but there's a really inexpensive uh, little finger test you can use uh, to determine that. But um, if I were to look at my genome uh, in the context of disease, I might actually be able to say something that's relevant. So. Um, if I had uh, uh, a cardiovascular disease and my physician was going to treat me with warfarin, what you could do um, is uh, look at my cytochrome P450 oxidase gene and determine uh, whether or not it was likely to respond to warfarin and if so, what the appropriate dose would be. So that information integration is absolutely critical to put information in content. Once you do this, especially in a research setting, you think about, you have to think about how you present that data and information to the local community. And what I mean by that is the research community. There's tremendous interest in consuming genomic data. What we really want to be in a position to do is to consume it effectively. Um, and um, what that means is that we have to allow uh, not only computational biologists and biostatisticians to have access to the data, but we have to make it broadly accessible. That's part of really this overall process of it as a computational scientist or computational biologist enabling research beyond your own. Uh, you then have to think about how you engage corporate partners to really make information broadly accessible uh, and to really get the best of breed tools. And a lot of that uh, really comes down to put, putting the data and information in a format that allows you to do research. And being a research scientist at heart, I'm going to tell you a little about some of the work that we've been doing. And then the last piece of the puzzle is really communicating information to the broader community. And the reason that we want to do that is that we want to take the data and information that we have available, and we want to assure uh, that uh, we explain to 
um, the non-scientists why the research we're doing is so important because for them, part of the process is contributing back by consenting to these studies. So I'm going to go through these and go through some of these uh, fairly quickly, uh, especially since we've burned some time dealing with technical difficulties. Uh, but uh, I think each one of these is important. And often people say, well, you know, you're a computational biologist at heart, John. Why are you interested in access to samples? And for me, it's, it's really dealing with the entire ecosystem that you need to put in place to be able to do the kind of work that I'm most interested in doing. So access to samples is really tied to some questions that are really profound that actually have at their heart uh, an IT component to them. Uh, what we'd really like to be in a position to do is to get patients into the process of being partners in understanding disease. And so what we really want to try to do is to get them involved. And if you talk to patients, I mean, patients come and visit our lab all the time. I've had patients call me and ask if they could contribute their genomes to have the genome sequence because they want disease better understood. Uh, so they really want to be part of this process. But what we have to do to get them involved is actually develop an informed consent. And that informed consent has to be structured in such a way that we allow patients to be partners in the research process. But there are regulations um, in play in the U.S., um, in particular HIPAA, the Health Insurance Portability and Protection Act. And what that requires that we do as part of the process is generate an informed consent, but also that we assure patient confidentiality. And this is actually a challenge in a genomic era because Genome sequence in and of itself is fundamentally identifiable. In fact, as little as 10 or 20 SNPs can be used to uniquely identify an individual. And if I have about 250,000 base pairs of genomic DNA, a tiny fraction of the entire genome, there are enough variant positions that I could identify each and every one of the two or three people, or hopefully hundreds of people who are listening to me today. Um, and so that data has to be secured. And what that really means is the whole idea of de-identification sort of goes out the window. And we have to think very differently about data security. <laughs> so in building computational tools for managing this data, uh, we really have to think about data security, data encryption, a whole set of things that most of us in the day-to-day -day practice of our research don't consider. And, and that really reflects the, the idea that identifiability has become a moving target that what we want to know is whether or not um, we can really secure the individual information about an individual patient yet make it accessible in the context uh, for research. So this is, is becoming an increasing challenge with the $1,000 genome in the age of Facebook. What this means uh, has really become unclear. I have a son, he's about seven and a half years old, and I can almost guarantee you that by the time he's 15 years old, his genome is going to be sequenced. I just don't want his genome to appear on Facebook, right? I want him to have access and control over who sees that data and for what purposes. But, you know, the thing I recognize is that younger generations have a very different view of privacy. That uh, my nephew is 21 years old, he's an undergraduate student right now, and I can look at his Facebook page, and so can his mom. And she can see things that he's doing that I wouldn't tell my mother today that I did when I was in college. I'm not saying I didn't do a lot of the same things he's doing, but who I shared it with and when I shared it was uh, a very, very different uh, than, you know, the way he's approaching privacy. And so we really have to think about privacy and confidentiality. But we have to understand that societal pressures and norms about this data are changing. And so we really need patients to be involved in this process. But most patients will tell you that if they have disease, they don't care who sees their genome. We have to then inform them that their genome is also partially their siblings, their parents, um, their cousins, their children's genome. And so this is really a challenge. And genomics has become a disruptive technology in how we think about this entire process of confidentiality. I mentioned you have to uh, develop a technology platform. That technology platform is really uh, uh, driven by our observation that the cost of genome sequencing is falling and falling dramatically. So this is a cost curve from the National Human Genome Research Institute. 
Um, this um, data, in fact, reflects um, information that's available on their website. I just reposted it or re, um, uh, plotted it using Excel. And if you're a quantitative nerd like me, what you'd probably like to do is to look at that data and fit a curve to it. And if you do that, do regression analysis on this, you realize it's kind of ridiculous that you don't have one curve, you actually have two curves. You have the old Sanger sequencing curve. And then you have this second generation of sequencing technologies. And I, I hesitate to call it next generation because my immediate question when somebody calls it next generation is what's next? Um, and I'm not really sure what that's going to be, if it's going to be next, next, or next, next, next. So we have the second generation, the clearly third and fourth generation technologies coming online. But what's interesting about it is as you look at this yellow curve, what you realize is that the cost of sequencing a genome started dropping dramatically in about uh, late 2008, early 2009. Uh, or, eight, late, or 2008, early 2009. And if you look at the data, the cost of sequencing genomes for the longest time was falling by about 33% per quarter. And, um, you know, that's, a number, that's sort of a trend that's a little difficult to get a handle on. But the way I think about it is if I were to start sequencing my genome in 2009, about um, uh, three and a half, four and a half years ago, if I were to sequence my genome then, in order to do that, I would have to mortgage my house. And today, sequencing a genome costs only a few thousand dollars. And I could put that genome on my credit card. And that fundamentally changes the way we think about genomic data in the context of health and wellness, in the context of research, in the context of disease. And so uh, if we look at the cost curve, the cost curve has actually leveled off a little bit. But when I stopped making this um, graph in 2011, adding data to it, I made predictions. And one of them is that we hit the $1,000 genome in October of 2012. Many of you may have realized that didn't happen. But in fact, we can generate a research-grade genome for about two and a half or $3,000. And we can generate a clinical-grade genome for about twice that, maybe a little more. But what's more important is that what we can interpret in most genomic sequence is just what's in the coding region. So we can do an exome um, uh, sequence for $1,000 or less and in fact do that in great enough depth that we could probably use it clinically. But where we see most of the applications is in targeted panels where we can sequence the thousand-fold depth for a few hundred dollars. So genomic medicine is actually here and here to stay. If you look at this regression curve and look further, you hit the thousand dollars, the hundred dollar genome sometime next year. Is that going to happen? Probably not. But I, I will bet you within two years we're at the place, at the point where sequencing genomes either with modifications of existing technologies or new technologies is going to be extraordinarily inexpensive. And really, uh, that they start, that kind of uh, application starts to make its way into the routine practice of medicine. So in 2010, we got an Illumina HiSeq instrument in our lab. Uh, and um, pretty quickly, we got to the point where we could sequence genomes for uh, less than $10,000. This was an instrument announced last year, the Iron Torn Proton. Their promise when they announced it was a $1,000 genome in 24 hours or less. The truth is we never got there. Uh, but, um, you know, this put a lot of pressure on uh, uh, the cost of genome sequencing. And um, there are more technologies that are in play. Uh, this was uh, the Oxford Nanopore Mini Ion, which was announced with great fanfare at the beginning of uh, 2012. Uh, the promise was a genome uh, through a USB um, insert disposable sequencer using nanopore technologies in minutes for hundreds of dollars. Uh, whether or not we actually get to the point where this technology really becomes a, a real and viable commercial um, product remains to be seen. But I can tell you I've talked to representatives of many different sequencing companies and that there are a large number of companies out there developing applications that really have the potential uh, to revolutionize um, DNA sequence data generation. So the challenge is that these new technologies have been transforming biomedical research from what was largely a laboratory science into what's increasingly an information science. What we need are new approaches to making sense of the data we generate. And the winners and losers in the race to really understand disease are going to be those best able to collect, manage, analyze, and interpret the underlying data. So 
what we've recognized we have to do is really focus on those questions by making information integration a central mission of almost everything we do. So uh, I want to point out that um, I was recognized along with some of my colleagues uh, at a ceremony at uh, the White House here in the U.S. Uh, for uh, something they call the Open Science Champions of Change. And uh, it was a really nice ceremony. There are a lot of people you may recognize here uh, from uh, the genomics world, uh, along with a few other non-genomic people who were an, um, uh, recognized. But what was really important about this, uh, at least from my perspective, is that this was a forum where people were talking about big data. And big data is the buzzword everybody throws around all the time. In fact, when you really think about it, big data is not a panacea for all the challenges we face. It's really the data in the context of the metadata. And um, one of the things I emphasized when I did a presentation at this ceremony was that the metadata is everything. That if, if we just generate genomic sequence, we're not going to learn anything unless we place that into context, something I've mentioned earlier. So we've really started thinking about this overall challenge of how we take clinical data and multi-omic data and use it to make sense of disease, to ask questions about the nature of disease. And one of the things we realized we needed to be able to do that was to gather the data together. And what we see almost everywhere I've been is that we have legacy systems in place collecting clinical data and in many places, omic data is simply stored on Unix file systems in some core facility. And that in order to bring data together, there's no really easable uh, easy and workable solution. So what we proposed when we were actually faced with this challenge now about seven years ago is that um, the only way to sort of solve this problem was to bring the data together into a central warehouse. And that once we did that, we could actually link the data and information together with information in the public domain and ongoing um, uh, projects like clinical trials to really drive the kind of research questions we wanted to be able to ask. So this was an essential part uh, of really thinking about building an infrastructure for genomic medicine. And one of the things that we focused on earliest in the process. So we collected and gathered this information together and what we did was we gathered it and, and used a commercially available tool. This is a, a tool from a company called uh, IDBS. It was originally developed by InfraSense. And it's a tool called Clinical Sense. And what I'm going to do is show you a brief video uh, right now that may stop. Um, and this video is actually a video that will take you through selecting a cohort of patients uh, by um, stepping through essentially what are pivot tables, selecting that cohort, and then taking that cohort and projecting it then onto genomic data and calling up other information like a Kaplan-Meier curve. So I may stop, you, uh, stop the video before the Kaplan-Meier curve comes up, but I want to show you this because for us, this was really a key element in making genomic data useful and usable to our end users whose primary use case was, can I look at genomic and clinical data together and define a cohort because the fundamental queries in biology are those in which we compare cohorts. So uh, I have my helper, Jen, um, who's going to roll the video now. So Jen, can you set that going? This is like the Wizard of Oz. I'm just the little voice that appears, and the real magic happens behind me.
in a cohort by selecting a variety of demographic uh, data points and taking that information and then uh, looking at a comparison between two cohorts and looking at two uh, uh, single nucleotide polymorphism or STIP markers and then looking to see whether or not those cohorts um, at, at had differences in overall survival based on those steps. So it's a very easy application, but it addresses a lot of the questions that users had for the data. And in fact, when we um, rolled this out, it was in a lot of ways very revolutionary because although the functionality seems simple, the procedures in place for getting access to data to be able to make these kinds of queries in most hospital systems is arcane at best that uh, one of the, the challenges that we've really seen uh, in, in trying to do population level studies is that one often has to go to multiple different data managers, actually fill out paper forms, ask for access to data, have people retrieve data from the databases, and then you have to, in many cases, manually mix and match different data sets to simply link together genomic data and, and clinical data or different demographic pieces of information. And so it becomes a real challenge. Uh, and what a system like this allowed study design to do is to go from weeks or months to minutes uh, where somebody could simply look and ask whether or not there's a big enough population. Now, someone sent in a question and asked about data security. And uh, the, the data security question is actually one you have to really think about carefully. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, this data is identifiable. So at every step in the process, one of our major concerns is how we safeguard patient, patient confidentiality. Do we think about encryption? How do we think about encryption? How do we protect data and information behind our firewall? And those are absolutely things that have to be part of um, our consideration as we put a system like this together. I mentioned that what you want to do is present the information to the local community. By that, I mean the research community. Um, in 2009, I was funded as part of a large consortium uh, for something we call the Lung Genomics Research Consortium, or LGRC. And uh, this was a project looking at pulmonary disease. So chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, or COPD, and interstitial lung disease, or ILD. It was a project in which we had data being generated on a set of well-annotated uh, samples with a tremendous uh, or a amount of clinical data associated with them. Um, those samples were actually selected, sent to a central location at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. Scientists there extracted RNA and DNA, sent it out to five other labs around the country, and we had as many as six different data types generated on each one of those 400 samples. Uh, so whole genome SNP profiles, whole genome expression data on arrays, RNA-seq, small RNA-seq, um, whole genome methylation data on charm arrays, and for a limited number of patients, exome sequence data. Our job was to collect all that data in a central location and make it accessible. And as we started to do that, we realized uh, that if we're going to make the data available and accessible, we had to do that by considering our users in distinct use cases. And we realized there were two broad classes of users. The first was a group of users like me, computational scientists, quantitative scientists, um, whose use case was very simple. Their use case was, John, you're an idiot. Just give me the data so I can analyze it the right way. But even for them, the data was so large they didn't want it all. They wanted to be able to go in and actually select a subset of the data. So what we built was something akin to an e-commerce shopping site. You could go in, load up a bundle, and download the data directly so you could have access to that data and information and then do your own analysis. And you could select by data type. You could select by a cohort you define. It was really designed to allow people to rapidly get to manageable data sets that they could then have uh, access to. Uh, and what the system allowed us to do was to control access to those data by uh, providing a level of security and authentic uh, authentication for each person logging in and for logging every transaction that happened so we know who had what data set to make sure we at least provided some accounting of how the data was used. Most basic biologists, though, were interested in different types of questions, and one of the questions they almost invariably asked was, across different populations, tell me about my gene or pathway of interest. And one of the things we tried to do in building this resource was every time somebody asked a question, we wanted to give them something back. 
So if I asked about a gene, if I started to type in a gene name, it would do text complete. On the left-hand side of the screen, what you can actually see is annotation for the individual genes, including pathways and go terms and inner pro domains. And as soon as I start to type in a name and select something, those metadata collapse to the relevant metadata for my particular gene. So if I want to rapidly zoom in on a pathway, I can type in an index gene, get that pathway, and then pull up all the genes that fit in that pathway. But once I have a gene, then what I do is I get information back almost immediately. So I, I present the users back with things like um, gene expression levels, in this case, RNA-seq data. And this is RNA-seq data at FPKM values, so it's not identifiable. Uh, but summary level data that at least shows them expression levels. And what you can see is we have mRNA expression here. We also have charm array data where they can look at different measures on those genes and see something. Uh, pathways are just collection of genes, so we have similar tools. Um, clinical data, we realized people wanted to look at the clinical data we had and develop cohorts. So we implemented a version of that tool I showed you earlier, the clinical sense tool from InfraSense. But then once we have cohorts defined, what we do is allow um, users to compare cohorts. And uh, we know that most users trust people like me to select at least a rational tool for doing most analysis. So for looking at the GWAS data, we had Plink. For looking at gene expression data, we had LIMA followed by GSDA. We try to make rational choices so that what we could do is allow users to define cohorts and then contrast those cohorts across every single data type we had. Um, and then we built in other tools that allow them to get access to the data in interesting ways, including uh, just ways to take sets of genes and do a comparison. But we wanted to make it easy, um, intuitive, and graphically driven because what we came to really understand very clearly is that's something our users wanted and needed. And we wanted to make, take um, access to the data out of the hands of the high priests, right, the, the statisticians and, and computational biologists, and uh, we wanted to make this Gutenberg's um, uh, Bible in the sense that we could take this data that was only accessible to um, a select few, the high priests, and really give everybody the opportunity uh, to speak directly to the gods who lived inside the data. Uh, we also recognized that part of that was engaging corporate partners, and it was really our understanding that we wanted to find the best tools. So some of the development I talked about was funded by a grant from Oracle. Uh, to build this integrated clinical and research data warehouse. We learned a lot, including the fact that um, structured relational databases aren't really best positioned to handle a lot of high-dimensional genomic data. Uh, we partnered with IDBS to create some of those data portals I showed you. We've worked with Illumina on a variety of different projects. We've had relationships over the years with companies like Ingenuity, CLC Bio, and other software vendors to support the people on our end who are the com consumers of genomic data. We realize that even though we're computational biologists, we don't always produce the best, most user-friendly tools. And if our goal is to serve our users, we have to swallow our pride sometimes and, and work with uh, people who are developing some really high-class tools. We've also built partnerships with other people who are interested in, in really entering the, entering the personal genomic space. Um, and uh, have been partners in developing different aspects of the entire ecosystem we've put in place. Uh, one of the things we realize we have to do is enable research beyond our own. So at Dana farber uh, in 2009, we launched something called the Center for Con uh, Cancer Computational Biology. Um, that was initially me with uh, Mick Carell, who was our associate director. Late last year, Yayu Wong took over as associate director. Uh, and what we've been doing at the CCCB is really providing broad-based support to the analysis and interpretation of uh, omic data in the context of disease. And it's really large data. We've dealt with other data types like um, text mining of uh, notes fields in EMRs and uh, other big data questions and problems. But our goal was to provide broad-based support here at Dana-Farber across the Harvard campus for scientists across Boston, and I can tell you we, we've worked with people around the world. Our model is actually a simple one, and it's one we found that works really well. We run this like a professional consulting service. So you come in, you meet with us, we, an, uh, we analyze your problem, we develop a work plan, we present you with a time and materials quote, so here's how long we think the project is going to take, and here's how much it will cost. And then once you decide you want to work with us, we actually execute on that model. And we deliver data and information back 
to uh, the end users in ways that they can consume it. We actually offer uh, support for IT infrastructure, so we've built websites and hosted data and information for people, and uh, we provide sequencing as a service. So the whole goal is really to try to build a resource that allows us to support users, and I can tell you we're supporting people uh, who work here, who have worked here, uh, and users who find us really from around the world. So this has been uh, a really useful model, and I'd be happy to talk to people or share information about how we've done that um, for anybody who's interested. But the real goal for us in, in doing all of this is to try to conduct research. And so I'm going to take you pretty rapidly through this research story, and I apologize for the speed at which I'm going to move to it, through it, but I realize that uh, you know, we have only 15 minutes left, and so I blame technology for slowing us down. But I'm going to tell you a story, a little bit of a story. And it starts with a project we uh, got involved with a few years ago that involved uh, uncovering hidden subtypes in disease. And this is really a major problem in a lot of diseases. We've seen it very clearly in cancer. Uh, i got a note that says I can take a little longer than the hour. So maybe I'll run over. Uh, but uh, one of the, the, the things we've been interested in doing is um, uh, comparing different cancer subtypes or different cancer um, disease states. And one challenge in doing that is that we don't fully understand the complexity of the disease. We're really starting to recognize that diseases are heterogeneous. And a nice example of this is probably breast cancer, one of my favorite papers in the entire field of genomic uh, medicine is Chuck Perot's paper on um, the discovery of subtypes in breast cancer. And it was really an eloquent and elegant study, uh, an, el an eloquent presentation in the paper of how one could take genomic data and discover new subtypes based on genomic profiles. So um, that has really become a, a paradigm in understanding disease because if we analyze all breast cancer as a single monolithic disease, one thing that becomes very clear very quickly is that there's a confounding effect that occurs and that, in fact, uh, we really end up looking at, in many cases, the major subtypes and, and missed signals in the minor subtypes unless we account for those and analyze those separately. So the project I want to describe is one in which we worked with ovarian cancer. Uh, ovarian cancer is a major killer. It's the fourth most common cancer in women. It's actually one of the most, um, the one with the, the greatest fatality rate. And it's really due to the fact that this disease is one that rapidly becomes chemotherapy resistant, in large part because the disease is detected late when it's already highly metastatic and uh, the tumors are evolving very, very quickly. So this is actually a project that we did in collaboration with Illumina. My colleagues here were Joyce Wu, uh, Michelle uh, Hirsch, and Ursula Matalonis, um, who worked with us on the clinical side, and they provided us with a set of samples that, include, uh, that included 132 very well annotated um, formalin-6 paraffin embedded samples. We profiled these on an early version of Illumina's uh, Dazzle array. Um, I, I won't comment on Dazzle today, but I will say that the Dazzle array we used was very reproducible uh, and provided very high quality data. Um, and we then took the data and Stefan Bentik, who worked with me, applied a technique which I'll describe in a minute called ISIS to find what we described as robust bipartitions in the data. Uh, we then took those and actually analyzed them. And one of the major subtypes we found was one associated with the expression of angiogenesis genes. We curated all the published gene expression data to validate the, the separation into two subtypes we found in the signature. And we've also found other subtypes that we've, um, we're in the process of describing in other publications. But really the, the major one I'm going to focus on today is this angiogenic subtype. So ISIS is a really interesting idea. It was developed by um, a group in Germany that Stefan had worked with, and the idea is very simple. You take your data and you randomly partition data into different subsets. And then you take um, uh, all the genes in the, in the data set and you do a statistical test comparing the gene in one uh, subset set and its expression levels in the other subset. And as we do that, what we find invariably is that no matter how we split the data, there are always some genes that support that bipartition, the separation of the data into two pieces. But if we look at the data critically, what we recognize is that while in any split, in any separation of the data, uh, the patient groups into two subgroups, 
we can find some significant genes. For a real separation, we should find many genes. And if we look at that, the, the uh, overall number of genes that we find that are statistically significant, we should find a larger number in a real bipartition. So essentially what ISIS does is it randomly parti uh, partitions the group into different subsets. It does this statistical task. It takes the top 100 genes and uses Fisher's rule for combining p-values and comes up with a summary statistic that we think of as the goodness of separation or the goodness of split. So Stefan did this, and I apologize the colors have um, changed here. What we found was one very robust bipartition of the data. It was actually also supported by micro RNA expression data that we had on the same samples. And what you can see here is that separation of the data into a large subtype, which is about two-thirds of the data, and a smaller subtype, about one-third of the data. And the difference between these subtypes was really driven by the expression of genes associated with angiogenesis. So we look back at our data set and we ask for our data set, is there a difference in overall survival? And if you can see the Kaplan-Meier curve on the bottom, it's a little faint, but uh, the lower subtype, the yellow one, is actually this angiogenic subtype. And um, it, in fact, is statistically significantly different. I mentioned this was supported by data on microRNAs, and I'm not going to talk about it in any great detail. Um, it's described in the paper we published. But then we went to other data sources. So we took our data, and uh, the irony was that publishing this paper was something that took us nearly two years. We kept on submitting it, and people initially said, well, it's just another subtype. How well supported is it? And we've invested a lot of time and methods for uh, producing robust biomarkers. So um, what we did was we amassed more and more data. And eventually, the TCGA data was available. We spent a couple months cleaning that data. And by the time this paper was finally accepted, we were able to identify nearly 1,100 high-grade late-stage serous tumors. And what we saw was this pattern continue with about one-third of the patients falling into the angiogenic subtype, two-thirds falling into the non-angiogenic subtype. And the separation and survival became more statistically significant. I mean, it's bad in all of these patients, but it's more statistically significant um, than it was for our data set. And then, in fact, we took all published ovarian cancer data, not just um, the original 129, uh, not just the, the serous tumors, which was what was represented in our 129 patients that we used to derive the signature. And in fact, we saw this trend continue and an increased statistical significance in, in the Kaplan-Meier curve. What was really interesting about this for us was that there were clinical trials underway in which patients were randomized to treatment with or without an anti-angiogenic therapies. And the reports in the literature and from people involved in these studies is that in the treatment arm, those patients were uh, receiving anti-angiogenic therapies, about one-third of those respond. So at this stage, it's numerology, but it's highly suggestive. And in fact, there's a trial underway now at Dana-Farber where they're randomizing patients, but also doing gene expression profiling. And our goal in, in analyzing the data that's being generated is going to be to see whether or not we could have predicted with some high degree of confidence who post hoc the responders and non-responders to this anti-angiogenic therapy were. If we can demonstrate that we can do that, then we actually have a clinically relevant subtype that we can use uh, in the next generation of trials to uh, assign patients to a treatment that's most appropriate. So this paper was actually, or this um, work was actually described in uh, a paper that was published in uh, PLOS One, I don't know, 2011, but it's easy to find. Um, so what I, I really want to talk about is the overall idea of using this to build different network models. So I'm going to take you through this, and I apologize that I'm going to run over time a little bit, but this is the stuff that's really cool and exciting, so bear with me. Um, why we care about networks should be obvious to anybody on this call, or at least I hope it is, that we see biological processes are not driven by individual genes, but rather by networks of genes. Our goal is to understand relationships in those networks and to use uh, genomic data, which has largely been expression data, to really deduce the patterns and relationships that exist um, that allow us to translate how these genes are expressed into how these genes influence the cellular phenotypes that we observe. 
So a lot of my thinking about this is actually influenced by my training in physics, and uh, it, it really speaks to the way we think about building and evaluating models. So what we'd like to be able to do in biology is develop a theory that describes the interactions that drive biological systems. The instantiation of that theory should be a model, and that model should describe the interactions that we'd like to be able to understand. In physics, we realize there are two broad pillars that support scientific inquiry, theory and experiment. But that often the theory is so complex, it's hard to relate back to experimental observations. So we also recognize a third branch of physics we call phenomenology that sort of sits squarely between theory and experiment. And in phenomenology, what we try to do is use empirical data to build models that are consistent with the theory, although not directly derived from it. And in building models in biological systems, that's exactly what we've tried to do, to build models that are consistent with our theoretical understanding but may not be derived from the theory directly. And the reason this is important is that as we try to build these models, what it allows us to do is subtly shift away from a question which I can honestly tell you I have absolutely no idea how to answer, which is if I build a model, is this model right? Because I can tell you that any model we build is probably not right. And I, I, well, I'll even talk about why I don't think I can answer that question. But the really important question that we want to ask is, is this model useful? Now, I lost the, the question there. Is this model useful? The reason I can't answer the question whether the model's right is that we're increasingly coming to understand that these network models rewire themselves as disease states develop. Oh, there we go. So that if I look at a network that I might consider right, and let's even assume we can define that, the normal network of interactions that occur in a normal tissue, as the disease develops and progresses, those interactions change. And when I draw one of these ball and stick diagrams and I'm showing you their set of interactions, what I'm always assuming when I draw that is that each interaction is unique and distinctive. But I can tell you the elements in this diagram, the balls, which are proteins, those proteins have no innate intelligence. They do not understand what they're going to bind to. And they'll basically bind to anything that has an appropriate motif. So if I turn one of their binding partners off, but turn on something else that they can stick to, they will bind to that, potentially activate it, influence behavior. They'll create a new network with a different set of connections. And so the fundamental problem in asking, is this model right, is that the model that's right in normal tissue may not be the model that's right in disease tissue, or the model that's right in one disease subtype may not be the model that's right in another disease subtype. So what we really wanted to do is to try to think about these subtypes in the ways that we can interpret them and to understand differences in the network topology. So one of the things my group did for a while was work on Bayesian networks, and that slide probably didn't need to be here. Uh, but one of the things we've come to recognize is that in building networks, and this is something that um, uh, Amir Jabari and I published on in 2009 describing a Bayesian network application, that one way to really help refine the queries we wanted to make or the models we wanted to build was to use prior sources of information. And so what I'm going to describe to you is an approach that um, uh, Kimberly Glass, who's really the lead on this project, a very talented postdoctoral fellow working with me, another faculty member at GCUM. Uh, who's her co-mentor, and a colleague and collaborator, Curtis Huttenhauer, developed. And it's based on the idea of modeling what happens in, in transcription. In order for a gene to be turned on, proteins called transcription factors have to bind within the genome and activate the assembling, uh, assemblage of a tr a transcriptional uh, machinery involving RNA polymerase, and that that creates uh, the mechanism by which RNA is actually transcribed from the DNA, or uh, uh, transcribed from the DNA. So as we thought about modeling this, what we wanted to do is actually use an idea that developed out of information theory called message passing. And the idea is actually really simple. It relies on the fact that we have transcription factors and they're downstream targets. Okay? And information is going to flow from the transcription factor to its target. But for that information to flow, both the transcription factor 
and its target have to be active and able to participate in that flow of communication. So I'm talking, hopefully, to someone out there. And as I talk to you, if I were to give you a quiz at the end of this presentation and ask you what you remembered about message passing, if you took that quiz and scored 100%, we would know that both you and I did our jobs in passing information back and forth, that I told you what you needed to know, and you weren't checking email or doing something else, that you were actually listening carefully. Okay? So as I pass information to you, I have to do my job, but you have to do your job. And if you get 100%, we both did our job. But if you fail, nobody other than you or me would be able to uh, understand why communication broke down. Is it that you're checking email and not paying attention, or is it I'm talking about my summer vacation instead of talking about message pass? So what we can do is really model that mathematically by creating mathematical functions we call the responsibility and availability. And we can try to fit those, but for a very simple network, we can't do that. But if we have a much more complex network, right, if I give a quiz to everybody listening to this presentation, and if most people get 70 or 80 or 90 percent, but two or three people, people fail miserably, then the most likely conclusion is that I've done my job in transmitted information but that not everybody received it. And so we can actually build a model like this, recognizing that with the whole genome sequence, we can look at transcription factors. We can take those transcription factors and use them to define an initial network. And we can take that network and then use other sources of data and information to refine it by calculating iteratively the responsibility and availability and eventually fitting it to the appropriate model. Okay? So what we did was we took Panda and we applied it to ovarian cancer data. And we used the biggest data set we had. It was 510 ovarian cancer uh, patients for whom we had gene expression data in the TCGA database. What we did was we normalized that data. We assigned it to uh, each patient to an individual subtype using the model we described in that paper. And what we found was that about one-third of the patients fell into this antigenic subtype. We then used an algorithm called PANDA, uh, which has been described in a paper uh, where Kimberly Glass was the first author in PLOS One. And what PANDA does is it fits this kind of message passing network model. So what's really interesting about it is we took these data, we used the motif data set priors, we built networks, and then we compared the networks. And the key thing in comparing these networks is that what we were able to do was uh, to look at these networks not based on the individual genes, but rather to look at the edges. Because remember, what we're seeing in these networks is that they rewire, and the atom of that rewiring is not the genes themselves, but the connections, the networks. So we're looking at how information flows, and we're seeing the information being rerouted in different disease sometimes. Okay? So, we can capture that by looking at the edges and the probability that these edges are real. And we can look at the target genes and their overlap. And the reason we default back to the genes, even though I've spent uh, the last minute or two persuading you the edges are important, is that the genes provide a basis for which we can interpret what's happening. And what's interesting is we look at the disease state, what we see is that in many cases, a lot of the same genes are targeted, but they're targeted in different ways in different subtypes. And that's going to be an important part of the message I'm going to tell. So every network paper has to have one of these um, fireworks diagrams. And what we focused on were the 10 transcription factors that you can see here in big gray balls um, that represent those that seem to change the most between the angiogenic and non-angiogenic subtypes. So this is the angiogenic subtype in red. This is the non-angiogenic subtype in blue. And if you actually look at this carefully, you can probably see the networks changing. And you may be able to see it uh, most easily in the upper right-hand corner where you see a lot of connections in the non-angiogenic network and fewer connections in the angiogenic network. But believe me, uh, there are real changes here. I'm going to show you a different um, way of representing this data that Kimberly developed um, actually in the next slide. And it's something that uh, I always call the spirograph, but Kimby really likes these. 
Uh, and what she does is she represents the transcription factors around the center and then their targets around the outside. And one of the really interesting things you start to see in this representation, which I'm growing more and more fond of, is the fact that there's some transcription factors that seem more active in the angiogenic subtype shown here in the center in red. There's some that are more active, meaning they have more connections in the non-angiogenic subtype shown here in the center in blue. But they're actually complex combinatorial patterns of regulation for particular genes that are not unique to one subtype or the other. So if we look at these key transcription factors, these 10 in the center of that circle, what we find is that for each one of them, we can make some kind of an association with um, gene expression data. With, um, the, we can make some kind of association with the disease phenotype. But what's really interesting is if we look at their patterns of expression, in most instances, we don't see a significantly different pattern under the expression of these transcripts. But if we look at their targets, what we do see is actually patterns of differential expression that correlate with patterns of methylation. And in fact, the, the, the representation here is skewed a little bit, but one of the really interesting things we see, if I look at this upper panel that says PF differential expression, the transcription factor itself uh, for the second column, which is ARID3A, the transcription factor itself isn't differentially expressed but its targets really are. And that's reflected in methylation data where the transcription factor is not differentially methylated between states, but its downstream targets are. And so this was a really interesting observation for us that the transcription factors weren't changing, but their influence was, right? So if we were to look for these transcription factors using gene expression data, we would never find them. But the network models actually point us to these transcription factors being so what it also suggests is the complex regulatory patterns that occur, and what we try to do is to classify genes based on whether they seem to be uh, more highly activated in the angiogenic subtype or the non-angiogenic subtype, and whether they're more highly targeted in the angiogenic or non-angiogenic subtype. So we define these gene groups and then began to look at whether or not those gene groups were relevant to understanding the angiogenic process. And again, invariably, what we found was that we could link the gene groups back to processes that were known to be associated with angiogenesis. And in particular, in this left-hand column here shown above and in the heat map, what we found was a strong degree of significance between those genes which were targeted and upregulated in the angiogenic network and, and, and the angiogenic subtype and processes we know are associated with angiogenesis. But we also saw these complex regulatory patterns where multiple uh, transcription factors interacted to begin to produce um, downstream effects. And that in fact, we looked, shown here in the top, at the likelihood that these transcription factors would occur, uh, co-occur in a regulatory pattern uh, by chance we found that we were seeing them at a frequency that was far, far greater than we'd expect by chance. So there's a statistically significant uh, enhancement of particular co-regulatory processes that we would see. And what was interesting about these is these processes actually suggest potential therapeutic intervention. And so by looking at these, we're able actually to look through the literature and suggest different therapies that might be useful. So these are detailed here. We actually um, uh, have a paper that's submitted that describes these. But what was most interesting about it is while we didn't have the opportunity to validate these in a set of laboratory models, what we were able to do is actually find support for uh, these different um, associations in the literature. And in fact, indications that in ovarian cancer models and other models uh, that these um, uh, that these uh, therapies and the interventions were actually uh, potentially actionable. And so in a paper we submitted, we actually show uh, a number of different studies with gene expression data available. And what's probably most interesting is the fourth one down, which is a, a study that involved gene expression analysis of ER-positive breast tumors that were treated 
with a drug that's shown to have some anti-angiogenic uh, activity. And the interesting thing shown in this heat map uh, to the right is that for the six different classes of genes that are regulated, we saw a response pattern that's exactly what we would have predicted if we look back at our network model. Okay? So uh, we're very excited about this. I have a few more slides um, that I would show if I had more time and about an approach we've been using to try to generalize this to individual patients. Uh, but I've gone on for a long time. I just want to say that Matt Tung and Kimberly have really come up with a very interesting approach to try to build network models for individual samples and in the case of applications to medical systems, individual patients. Uh, but they're, they're starting to show us a lot about the way in which these networks act and function. Um, and we've applied it to looking at diseases like breast cancer to try to understand whether we can identify even more uh, subtypes in the disease. The last thing I want to mention is we want to communicate the mission back to the community. Um, if I had time out at, if, and if I trusted um, this system not to crash by showing a video, um, I would uh, ask uh, Jen to show the video, but I'm not going to do that. Uh, but uh, if you go to our Lung Genomics Research Consortium website, you'll see um, a website that we designed. We actually invested about one half of 1% 1 of our budget. We hired a web development team. We hired a, web, a science writing team to interview the scientists and develop uh, really concise descriptions of the project and why it was important and information for patients. And then what we did was we uh, put this as a public-facing part of our portal and uh, made it available to really describe to the broader community why this work was so of such fundamental importance. Um, if you go and look at it, you'll probably realize that it's really nice and well laid out. My uh, mother's looked at it a lot of times, and my picture actually in the animation shows up at the end uh, because we showed the scientists and the people who uh, developed the website worked with me, and so they put me front and center. I should have been other people on the project, but you know, my mom likes to come and see my picture and show her friends so she can be proud. Look, there's my son, the scientist, who actually works on interesting, important things. But for us, this idea of communicating to patients is absolutely essential. And the reason this is, uh, the reason for this is that fundamentally patients are the ones um, that are necessary if we're going to change the way we approach curing disease. Everybody says, I want to cure disease. What we're ultimately discovering is that that I, uh, that we is always the royal we, that there are barriers to sharing the data, that if I give you my data and you discover something, I get no credit, so I have no uh, incentive to share data. And what we're really starting to see is that as patients get involved, those barriers break down. So um, I personally think about the fact that I want people to share data because my experience in analyzing large data sets is the only way to make this whole system work is to have access to the most possible data, the greatest, most extensive metadata that makes sense of, of the, the information that we have available. So the last point I want to make is just that genomics is here to stay. Um, the short version of this story is in 2010, I had the opportunity uh, to spend some time in Australia working with some colleagues and friends there. and. Um, the real story is I, I went down with my family and we arrived and we rented a car for the three months we were there. I came home from the car rental place with the keys and if your family works like my family, my wife took one look at me and one look at the keys and uh, for the next three months uh, she drove and I rode the bus. Uh, but I was riding in the very next day to work with my uh, colleague. She actually drove me around quite a bit and I got to drive there too. But on a day-to-day -day basis going to work, I typically rode the bus. Uh, and uh, the second day I was there, the first day I was working with my colleagues, I looked up and I saw this sign on the bus in Brisbane. It said, spitting is unacceptable. Bus operators are now equipped with DNA kits to assist with the apprehension of offenders. So I realized this was a good place to do, be doing genomic science and that genomics is increasingly a part of our everyday lives. So I open with quotes. I'll quickly close with two. This is from one of my favorite authors, William Gibson. Said the future is here, it's just not widely distributed. And then, uh, since I'm a physicist, I have to close with a quote by physicists because you now know that physicists are the smartest people on earth. Uh, so Fermi said, uh, before I came here, I was confused about this subject. After listening to your lecture, I am still confused.
but at a higher level. So there are a couple of questions which I'm going to answer for anybody who wants to bear with me. Uh, but uh, I want to thank you all for um, uh, soldiering through um, the technical glitches we had and for staying a little bit longer. And uh, if I've done my job, you're highly confused, but I'll try to resolve that. All right. So thank you. I can hear the applause. Um, I just want to point out this work is um, work that's been done by a really talented group of people and supported by a lot of different organizations. My email address is here at the top. My name is Quackenbush, so if you Google me, you can find me. Um, but if you have other questions, feel free to drop me a note. All right? So uh, I've had nine questions come in. Some of them I've actually answered during the course of uh, the uh, presentation, but I'll step through them quickly. The first one is, do patients know that, uh, well, they consent to have their sequence analyzed. They may be exposing characteristics of their relatives. And as I pointed out earlier, informing them of that is actually an important piece of the informed consent. And I don't think anyone has really come to grips with what that means and whether or not we should actually get consent more broadly. But one advantage we sometimes have in looking at tumor biology is that if we're looking at the somatic genome, the genome that's mutated in the tumor, there are often many more mutations, so that identification and tracing that back to a germline is much more difficult. That said, to be honest, I think anybody's genome um, uh, is potentially identifiable thematic or germline. And I think we just have to be very careful. I think we also have to really think through uh, protection, discrimination, and all the issues associated with that. So it's a challenging social, ethical, and legal question. Uh, someone else asked about how we protect data and how uh, we secure um, the data information prevent unauthorized access. And uh, for us, this has really been uh, one of the key elements in thinking through the process. There is no absolute security, but there isn't with any data store. One of the things we see most often, though, is the greatest data breaches come not from anything that we would think about putting in place, but actually physical security that people themselves are the weakest link. And when you look at um, violations of HIPAA, this Health Insurance Portability and Protection Act, patient confidentiality requirements here in the U.S., it's somebody losing a laptop in a cab or somebody um, losing a flash drive um, on an airplane. Uh, it's not somebody hacking into a system. That said, when we build our systems, we really want to assure we have secure firewalls, the data is encrypted, we control access, um, and we really make sure people are getting access for the right reasons. Someone asked about the LGRC website. I apologize, I didn't put this up. Uh, you can find it by doing a Google search for Lung Genomics Research Consortium, but uh, the, the URL is actually lung, L-U-N-G hyphen genomics.org. It's lung-genomics.org. The research portal is up. It actually, uh, it may only be partially functioning today uh, because um, we had a problem actually with our security certificates that we're trying to work out. And somebody asked if we could query for your favorite gene, and the answer is absolutely yes. So you can easily, if things are working, apply for a login, get one, log in, and query for genes. A cohort selector may not be working, and that was the last word I had before the presentation. Someone asked, does genomic medicine need FDA approval? And um, the answer is, really, it depends on the application and how you're going to use it. So uh, one of the things that we've seen time and again is that a lot of the applications which are uh, making their way into the practice of clinical medicine today are those in which we're already testing for things that can be tested using other types of application as part of the routine standard of care. So again, some of this has to do with placing information into context. If I have a patient who has colon cancer and I know that patient has a KRAS mutation, then I can tell the physician that they probably shouldn't be treated with EGFR inhibitors because they're unlikely to work. And so in fact, in the, in the, the uh, part of the standard of care now for patients with colon cancer is to test them ahead of time for these KRAS mutations to understand whether or not they have these particular mutations. So the implementations of genomic medicine that we're starting to see are those in which we test uh, fixed panels of potentially clinically actionable uh, variants. 
And what we report back to physicians are those which are known to be clinically actionable in the disease today, okay? And in that case, uh, that information is typically checked and vet, uh, vetted by somebody like a pathologist who's qualified to draw those conclusions uh, because if we have software tools doing that, it starts to become something that does need FDA clearance. But if we're providing evidence to someone who can then provide that guidance to someone who can ultimately make a decision and only provide them with the molecular evidence. Um, we're using already established tests um, and um, we're, we're providing guidance back to those who are knowledgeable in how to interpret them. But, you know, do you need FDA guidance and approval? The, the sort of short answer is you need to uh, really look at the individual application and understand how the data and information is going to be used and what the um, what the ultimate goal of your application is going to be. So uh, another um, listener, and wow, there are quite a few, uh, wrote to ask what the goal of modeling was. Is it to determine appropriate estimators and discriminators, or is it to uh, understand something else about the system we're looking at? And again, uh, I apologize for not being able to give a definitive answer, but one of the things that we've seen so often is that the goal of modeling really depends on what you're trying to do. So some of the modeling we do is really focus on trying to understand whether the new subtype. Some of the modeling we do is to do patient classification. But some of the modeling we do is to try to understand the mechanisms associated with the distinct phenotypes we observe. And so our goal in building models um, varies between the different projects we look at. But our ultimate goal is to capture something about the underlying biology and hopefully to capture it in a way that uh, informs us about the mechanism of disease so that ultimately we can use that to build better diagnostics and better therapeutics. Another question had to be, uh, another question um, uh, is focused on confounders and the fact that disease is, is constantly undergoing evolution. And um, that is, in fact, a really important consideration in any of this, that what we're doing is when we're taking a snapshot of disease by looking at a tumor biopsy, that's typically something for patients which is uh, treatment naive. Uh, we often uh, don't know what's going to happen to that tumor over time. So we're trying to use available data before treatment to predict what's going to happen. And what we really recognize is there are limitations. So that in the best of all possible worlds, we'd be able to follow the evolution of the tumor under the selective pressure of therapy. There are some diseases like blood-based cancers, like um, lymphomas and myelomas, where we can do that very easily. There are other diseases like solid tumors where it's simply not feasible. So while I'm very excited about genomics, one of the other things I realized is that one of the things we do with our patients all the time is image them. And there's an emerging field called radiomics, where people try to extract high-dimensional features from uh, radiological data. And I've been working with a colleague here, Hugo Ertz, who's an expert in radiomics, to try to link genomic data with radiomic data to really see if we can use them together to build better predictors uh, that take into account the, the fact that these tumors really are mutating and changing under selective pressure. Um, I um, I guess the last question was um, for the LGRC website, which I think I gave, and then someone asked, uh, someone thanked me for adding uh, his question. So uh, I hope whoever you are had answered your question and answered, appro uh, answered it appropriately. I don't know what your question is, so I apologize. So those are all the questions I had. You've been with me uh, for a very long period of time. So I hope this was interesting. I hope it was informative. And um, I apologize for the technical glitches. I've given this presentation in far less than an hour in the past. Um, so I thank you for bearing with me. And um, if you have questions, you can always send me an email. So friends uh, at BioConference, is there anything else? Or is it time for us to say goodbye? Oh, I got a standing ovation from one of the uh, 
the listeners. So, uh, thank you again. I, I've only seen two names among the questions. There's three names among the questions. Oh, four names. So uh, to the four of you, uh, thanks for taking time out of your afternoon or evening or morning. Um, and uh, feel free to contact me if there's anything else. All right. So have a, a good rest of your day. And uh, hopefully we'll be able to do this again.